Dave, will you turn to the Sustainable Communities Report? I sure will. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Vice President. We're going to now open the discussion on, uh, on the issue cluster called Sustainable Communities. Uh, Jonathan Adams and Governor Cunin were co-chairing that activity, but uh, as I understand it, Jan, uh, Tom, John, sorry, each one of the members of your group are going to say, have a few things to say. Uh, that's correct, uh, Dave. What we would like to do is I'll make a brief uh, overview, and then uh, each of the members, with the exception of Dave Bazzelli, will uh, give about a two minutes uh, overview of their area of expertise as it relates to uh, communities. But first I want to say thanks to the liaison members who worked with and gathered this information, and to the groups that came forward. There were many who did. And uh, that was very educational and enlightening to all of us to understand just how significant the communities were out there. And now while some of the language that you see in our paper may be a little confusing to you, uh, it may not be, uh, the language may be new or the words new and the definitions a little hazy, uh, the concepts will not be at all. Um, as you can see from the paper itself, we believe that to achieve sustainable development, activities must be done at the community level. And that follows really from what Judy and uh, Michelle has ju uh, just told us about listening to the communities. And the research for uh, this task force found an emerging and strong sustainable communities movement in the uh, communities throughout the United States, something that many of us did not know. These communities are working to integrate environmental, economic, and social justice concerns. A key element of these efforts is an intensive planning effort that involves a broad range of parties who have traditionally not worked together. Politicians, the business community, community activists, and environmentalists. In the environmental area, uh, communities are considering innovative programs in land use, transportation, building design, energy efficiency, water supply and treatment, and recycling. This council has an opportunity to provide support to this effort in the following ways, among others. By identifying the specific elements that have made these efforts successful, by publicizing these elements and efforts uh, to a national audience, again, back to Judy and uh, Michelle, and by identifying public policies and programs that can enhance uh, these efforts, particularly federal programs and federal programs that inhibit community development. The work of the other task forces relate directly uh, to the work of the Sustainable Communities Task Force, as you can well imagine, energy efficiency and the like. And uh, so we hope that we can have a, a, a very much of a, a broad uh, shaping of communities throughout all of the task force, and we recommend that we continue a task force on sustainable communities. And now we will uh, get right into our, um, our two minutes by each of the other members, starting with Madeline Cunin. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief since we'll have another opportunity to discuss education issues in the cross-cutting area. But uh, just a few brief comments. I mean, education here obviously plays such a key role because the decisions that are made really depends on what people believe uh, will work in terms of either the environment or uh, economic development. And what they believe depends on what they know. <laughs> and what they know really comes from a variety of sources, uh, both their formal education, their peers, and the whole media environment around them. Uh, our, if we are to take the concept of sustainable communities and spread it beyond the examples that now exist, uh, the education process has to deepen and broaden to an extent that this becomes not an isolated example of success, but really a national example of how the decision-making process should work. 
And I see some parallel here between using the communities as um, the, the role models, if you will, for national policy or the incubators of change and um, really paying attention to what is happening at the local level, often without any national incentive, but because of local community support, but also examining the barriers, examining the incentives, so that we can forge a national agenda for sustainable development from some of the activities that are happening at the community level. This will mean more aggressive education, both in the formal education system and more uh, a dissemination of existing information in the informal system so that we share a common understanding of not only what sustainable development means, but how it can actually be put to work. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, Tom Donovan from the AFL CIO is going to speak next about jobs and the health aspects as they relate to this uh, community task force. Mr. Chairman, the, the paper uh, emphasizes the need to integrate economic, environmental, and social concerns and notes that in the past too often uh, those issues have been addressed in isolation. Uh, all of that in echo of the earlier discussion that we had here. With specific reference to economic development and jobs, the paper suggests that the Council explore opportunities to promote job growth within existing communities, both as an absolute and as it relates to job growth that might flow from environmentally sustainable practices. These latter would obviously include jobs that result from waste or toxic cleanup, rehab of existing infrastructure, or the construction of new or rehabilitated energy efficient buildings and transportation systems, the manufacture of environmental technology or equipment, or jobs in recycling. The report further notes that all job initiatives must consider the need to improve worker safety and protection and that technical assistance and job training ought to be available to enhance the sustainability of jobs. Obviously, all of our economic development and jobs concerns would be integrated with the concerns about land use, about built environments and public education, and the paper notes the need for relating economic development and job concerns with the work of the energy, the eco-efficiency and natural resources <coughs> task forces particularly with reference to planning, national transportation policy, infrastructure, and so forth. Finally, the paper notes the need to explore credit availability for women and minorities, initiatives to promote community banking, loans, and mortgages for sustainable economic activities, and it argues for an integrated approach to economic, social, and environmental issues and suggests that that highlights the need for representation from HUD and the Department of Labor on the task force. On a personal note, let me add that we need to ensure the earliest examination of these issues in communities where sustainability is threatened by an excess of zeal in any segment of the community. And we need to demonstrate the need for communities to be able to improve current economic activity to make it compatible with sustainability because without that, we're only going to offer the promise of new jobs growing out of cleanup or rehab activities, and that simply won't be enough. Uh, there's one side issue I would like to mention as someone who doesn't work every day with the issues and terms that are the currency of this commission. Uh, I'd offer a plea for our avoiding jargon in our public communications. I agree with Jay Hare. Uh, if you were to go outside and ask somebody to discuss sustainable development, you'll get very few takers. Uh, but I suspect most of the people you'd meet in the street could discuss the balance between environmental concerns and their jobs. And that's the level at which we can only, that's the only level at which we can hope to successfully communicate. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. The next uh, speaker is Ben Chavis, and he's going to talk about why environmental justice is important in the community's context. Thank you. There's an emerging movement growing throughout our nation at the grassroots level. The environmental 
justice movement. It is a multiracial movement. It is a multicultural movement. It is multilingual. It represents the diversity of our nation. And while there's much in our society, Mr. Chairman, that divides us, polarizes us, the environmental issue has emerged as one that can unite us. An environmental justice movement also affirms the necessity for sustainable development and defines sustainable development with the definition that we're using here at this council. Uh, not to have a bifurcation between economics and environment, but to see uh, them as being inextricably linked. Um, also, I want to stress that from the economic development point, I just want to say I agree with Tom, uh, just said from the previous speaker, that uh, the solution to environmental injustice, to uh, environmental racism, it goes beyond just uh, fairness. We want equal enforcement of environmental laws, but we also want equal opportunity in economic development. So much of environmental injustice is in the context of economic inequality. And um, I think that the benefit of this council uh, uh, will serve the environmental justice movement, but by the same token, the environmental justice movement has something to offer uh, to this council. You note on the paper that's presented on page three that a growing understanding of commitment to the principles of environmental justice underlie the movement for sustainable development. Um, and most significantly in regard to the principles of mutual respect and racial justice, full participation by all concerned communities, particularly communities of color, and the right of all people to a safe and healthy work, uh, to have safe and healthy work and a home environment. Communities are where people live. Uh, and to talk about the concept of sustainable communities, uh, we believe that uh, that discussion and that dialogue must be an inclusive discussion, an inclusive dialogue, representing the racial diversity, the ethnic diversity of our nation. Um, and I think that that's an asset, not a liability. I believe that the work of this council is vital to the future of our nation. Uh, not only to serve a bridge in terms of some of the racial polarization, but to talk about having an integrated economy where there's full participation in the economy by all sectors of our society. And so forth. I think that there have been expectations raised uh, by the fact that President Clinton has appointed uh, uh, this particular council. And I think that the uh, results of the Council on Sustainable Development have far-reaching implications uh, for the future of our nation. We're going to turn it over to you now, Dave. Thanks, John, and thanks to all of you. Uh, I guess, really, I'd like to open it up for discussion. I think uh, I did hear very loud and clear that you've approached this from looking at it from very different aspects, some different aspects, and that you've also recommended that we add to the committee uh, some constituents that are not on the committee. I think you mentioned uh, Tom Hudd and uh, Department of Labor, both, in your opinion, should also be added to the efforts. Comments? Questions? This group wasn't this bashful before, Vice President. Well, I, I'm not uh, bashful. I'll jump in uh, at this point, uh, <laughs> Dave. I, I enjoyed the presentations and enjoyed uh, reading uh, the material that uh, was uh, produced by the task force uh, in advance of the meeting. Uh, I want to elaborate briefly on uh, one initiative in the administration that um, will benefit from the work of this task force, and I, and I do this so that in your ongoing work you will feel free to make suggestions about uh, how, how we are proceeding. The President signed an executive order as part of the Reinventing Government uh, initiative that establishes a, a community empowerment board. One of its tasks will be to implement the uh, legislation that uh, allows the administration to pick uh, 
enterprise zones uh, and uh, then go beyond that by coordinating the work of the cabinet departments and agencies uh, in order to take a more unified approach in trying to, to uh, lift up the quality of life in communities that have been devastated uh, over the years. And in trying to decide how to implement this new strategy, we've had a whole series of uh, briefings and workshops to try to bring in people who uh, have had hands-on experience in communities that are like the ones uh, we're trying to help. And we had a very interesting session last week on sustainable communities and sustainable development. What does it really mean at the local level? And um, many of the uh, people who were present had talked with and benefited from uh, a dialogue with members of this uh, task force. Uh, and, and it was um, it was quite interesting because, uh, as Ben Chavis said, when you talk with people in community groups and at the grassroots level in uh, areas that uh, have not shared in the economic progress of the country generally, uh, you will find a, a greater emphasis on uh, uh, improving the quality of the environment there than uh, a lot of people would uh, expect just armed with the uh, old way of looking at these things. A and the prospect of trying to alleviate the problems of a distressed community by quickly locating a new smokestack industry uh, or a new business that uh, does not pay attention to uh, I its relationship to the environment uh, is seen very differently by people in the community than it is by those who have the ambitious plans to try to get them jobs according to the uh, old way of doing things. Uh, and reconciling these two s different objectives is really at the heart of what this council is all about. And increasingly, we're finding it's uh, central to the work of this uh, community empowerment strategy. Now, there are many other things that have to be taken into account as well. And in a larger sense, I, I think that the kind of debate unfolding here in this council and in the country generally reflects a, a very large philosophical shift in our public debate away from single cause, single effect analyses, away from an approach that identifies a single problem one day and goes after it with a targeted strategy and then moves on the next day to some other policy. And, and uh, while moving away from that, moving toward a more systemic approach, uh, identifying communities as uh, living systems that are extremely complex and cannot uh, be changed without an awareness of the, the way a lot of different factors interact. Uh, and when you take that approach, uh, sustainable development begins to look um, a little different. That's why I think it's so important for the debate in this council to not only examine um, environmental policies through an economic lens, but also to examine economic policies through an environmental lens, to bring both the perspectives together and to respect the fundamental tenet of sustainable development, which is uh, we have to find a way to engender economic progress and development without sacrificing the ability of the next generation or the generation after that to enjoy the same improvements and uh, increases in the quality of life. Um, our whole effort to uh, reinvent the federal government's relationship to local communities is, is therefore uh, going to take place in a, in a way that respects this, the work of this council. Um, 
I, I was very interested in each of the presentations and very interested in following the continuing work of the task force uh, and, and the council. So I want to invite your continued input uh, on the community empowerment initiative as well. Thank you. Uh, in fact, we had a discussion a little earlier this morning and we agreed that uh, that the economic side and the environmental side could no longer be a teeter-totter, mm -hmm. uh, which is historically the way I think we've been approaching it. Comments? Carol? I, I just want to say that I think um, this may be one of the most important task forces and one of the most important undertakings of this committee. Uh, the problems that we see in terms of the programs that we have responsibility for and uh, the ongoing environmental degradation in our urban centers is quite significant. One out of four Americans live near a Superfund site. Forty percent of our rivers, lakes, and streams continue to not be suitable for fishing and swimming. Uh, we have drinking water problems. I think many of us are aware of the very horrible situation that occurred in Milwaukee earlier this year and just last month. Manhattan, people were asked to boil their drinking water supplies. We have dozens and dozens, something in excess of 50 cities that continue to have non-attainment problems when it comes to air issues. And as we look across all of those issues, what becomes clear to us is that they are intertwined and that the solutions are absolutely intertwined. And in fixing one, we can sometimes cause another problem. And if we don't recognize by looking at the community as a whole, the interconnection, we are never going to solve these very real and these very pressing problems. When I look at the work that I've done and the work that EPA has done in terms of dealing with communities where the best decisions have been made, there is one fact that runs through those. It is the opportunity for early and involved community participation. It distinguishes the successes from the failures, where the community is given real information and real opportunity to participate time in and time out. They will make the tough decisions and they will make the right decisions in terms of uh, the future uh, environmental protection and, and the quality of life. So I would just hope that as we move forward in, in the council and looking at these issues, that we also recognize that the Sustainable Communities Task Force needs to be connected with the Eco-Efficiency Task Force and the Energy Task Force, that there are some natural connections there and that they can each benefit from each other's work. If we don't do that, we run the danger of once again developing solutions that work in one context, but perhaps create problems in another context. Uh, thanks, Carol. In fact, the discussion we're having on sustainable communities and the one that we started on, on public outreach, linkage, and education, I mean, you start to get a feeling that these are not silos and we can't treat them in silos, and I think uh, you exhibited that. There was uh, somebody else over here I saw had their hand up. Yeah. I'm sorry. John? One of the suggestions that we have made is to uh, perhaps hold a meeting in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, <laughs> and uh, uh, because of a very uh, vigorous uh, community down there. And I was wondering, uh, I'm told that you may know something about that? Yeah, I do. I do. I can't take a lot of credit for it, but I know a lot about it, and I know a lot about the, uh, the people who've been involved there. What they did in Chattanooga, and there are a few other examples around the country. <coughs> Chattanooga is the one I know the most uh, about. Uh, but they, they took the uh, protection of uh, the local environment and the enhancement of the local environment there as kind of the organizing principle for their efforts to renew and revitalize the city and bring it back to life. And they have done a marvelous job. Mm -hmm. They're going to be manufacturing electric buses. They, they have uh, uh, cleaned up the riverbank and opened up a whole new park there. They've redesigned the, the flow of vehicles and people through the downtown area. They've gotten all of the businesses uh, involved very deeply in this. And one of the things that has happened is uh, a, a feeling of pride in the, the city itself has grown tremendously. Those of you who have been to Chattanooga know that uh, geographically it has one of the most uh, stunningly beautiful locations uh, of, of any city 
in the United States uh, with the mountains uh, hovering right over it and the river on the other side. It's just really beautiful. But over the years, uh, the accumulation of uh, air pollution in the, uh, in the valley there uh, has, had a, has taken a toll. And uh, all of the inter interrelated problems that everybody is familiar with but they just decided to really take that on as a, as a community. And it has made all the difference. The, the results are, are, are quite uh, stunning. And uh, the, the, the involvement of the grassroots uh, groups in the community has been uh, so uh, encouraging. I think you talked earlier, John, about one of your task force's conclusions relating to uh, groups that haven't worked together uh, figuring out ways to, to work together. The, um, the whole theme of sustainable uh, development and environmental protection that goes hand in hand with creating jobs turns out to be a meeting ground for community groups and business groups, uh, church groups and governmental organizations where everybody can kind of uh, agree on a common approach and it's worked extremely well in Chattanooga. Well, and that's what we have found uh, from the other groups that came forward and talked to us about it. It was this spirit of, uh, of renewal and uh, pride that we seem to see. And I, I actually believe that uh, one of the most important things we will do will be to support these communities in uh, developing their activities. I'd like to ask if it's worth discussing right now what federal policies could help do that, because it's key in, in the... Uh, with this task force uh, being appointed by the federal government, we should be looking to those policies. And the other question is uh, population issues and how will that relate uh, to uh, these communities? What kinds of population trends, growth, or uh, mix of uh, people in the communities, or loss of population, and how will that impact these communities? Hmm. Well, those are not easy questions. That's. Uh uh, those are the ones we're asking your help with. Uh, if, we, if we knew all those answers, we, we wouldn't uh, be calling for help from this council. But uh, uh, there, the linkages that uh, we talked about earlier relate to the same questions you're asking there. If you do a better job of education uh, and economic development, you're, you're going to have an impact on the, the way the pattern of development unfolds in the, in the community. You'll have an impact on population issues, urbanization issues. If you do a better job in rural uh, communities, then you, you're going to have an impact on, uh, on urbanization. I might just uh, lateral it to Katie McGinty, who has been at the intersection of, uh, uh, of, of reconciling these issues uh, in the White House to see if she has some comments on this. Well, actually, John, um, the very two issues that, that you raised, I, something I wanted to reflect a couple of thoughts on. Um, one, in terms of federal policies, I don't have a laundry list of them, but I think you put your finger on exactly what the, I think could be a critical role of this council, um, shored up by the work that the Vice President is doing with the empowerment zones. That is that even if a community um, does know is the one in the 100 on the street that knows what sustainable development is, is interested in pursuing a sustainable development course, there is a bewildering array of possible federal programs that may help or may be relevant to that initiative, but they are literally impossible, I think, to access. Uh, not only federal programs, but given the diversity of this, this working group, each of you know private sector or, or programs from your own backgrounds and expertise that also can be relevant in fostering the work of a community that is inclined to try to pursue this different course of development. And it's a very difficult job. We're facing it right now in our work in responding to the floods in the Midwest, where some communities are very anxious and eager, um, actually to our, the degree of the interest is, is really surprising to us in pursuing a different path than just simply rebuilding the levees and rebuilding them higher and rebuilding them more quickly. But when they turn and say, okay, what are our alternatives? We have to say, well, um, now how high did you want that levee and how quickly can we rebuild it? It's very difficult. Uh, we are right now undertaking a, an exhaustive analysis of what kind of alternative policy uh, instruments we might have at our disposal so that for a community that's interested, we can provide them an alternative. We are not good at doing that right now. 
The second thing on your point about population, I think this harkens back a little bit to the discussion we had earlier as to whether these issues are for the developed countries as well as the developing countries. And this is something that Tim has always talked about but became very clear to me uh, in a meeting I had two weeks ago with a group from uh, Charleston, um, no, Charlottesville, Virginia, who is trying to uh, produce a sustainable development plan for their region as well. And one thing that really galvanized the community, they looked at a couple areas around Charlottesville where in one area the population is currently 12,500 people. But they did an assessment and an analysis of what the possible population growth could be in that area, only excluding those areas that simply could not be built on or could not be inhabited. And the population potential was 135,000 people. All of those 12,500 people then who looked around and said, geez, I really like my area, I like my neighborhood, I like my community, and I really wouldn't want a skyscraper right next door or a huge apartment building or something like that. The putting numbers on it, making it real to the individual community as to what the possible pressures are on the resources and the community that they enjoy right now really galvanized a lot of interest and a lot of act activity and action by that community to say, hey, we've got to stop right now. We've got to start planning. We've got to see what the potential is here and try to come at this with a more reasonable and more informed view. So I think uh, for Tim's work on this, that brings it right home for us, and it really has galvanized that community. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and of course, we're going to hear from Tim this afternoon, uh, not this afternoon, at about 11.30. We're going to be talking about population and consumption issues. So maybe, Tim, it would be worthwhile to delay the, the uh, discussion on population issues until then. Uh, David, yes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I, that's a nice prelude to this afternoon, but let me, I, I'd like to just make one other comment about uh, Ben's presentation in this paper. I think that as the idea of sustainable communities has the potential of being a wonderful catalyzing process, as we have discussed, it also has enormous potential of changing what I think is, is a very uh, dangerous stereotype about the discussions of environmental issues. I think there has been an assumption made in American politics and American communities for a long time that inner city America, minority America, has not been concerned about the environment, but rather has been concerned only about jobs. And I think that what Ben has been saying and what others understand is when you really talk to people, the nexus between the environment, health, and jobs is a very, very intense one. And there is a vast yearning out there to join these and to try to sort through how to understand how we deal with this issue. A lot of the local leadership that I have dealt with in any case has been part of the old stereotype, saying don't talk to us about the environment because that's sort of a suburban issue out there. We're just interested in jobs. Whereas the people who are really at stake are saying just the opposite. Now, if we have a responsibility on this committee to raise the level of concern about the nexus between the environment and the economy, i.e. sustainable development, then I think this issue is very powerful. And as recommended at the end of this paper, the discussion of having hearings around the country, I think, is extremely important, not only to look at the catalyzing process of a Chattanooga or other sustainable communities, but also to, it seems to me, rid perhaps the, rid this country of a lot of the discussion that these two issues are mutually exclusive, the environment and the economy, particularly as it relates to poor people in America. They are as concerned as everybody else, maybe more intensely concerned, and we have a job to help get that message out, and there's a tremendous potential in this working group to help us to do so and to help the country to come to this newer awareness, which I think is very powerful and very important. Thanks, Tim. In fact, we're going to be talking a little later this afternoon about uh, moving our meetings around the country. And uh, the mayor of Chattanooga has already contacted us and invited the entire council to come to Chattanooga, as well as a number of other cities. And we're going to talk about that this, this afternoon.